Well, for me, in my involvement with football and the women's national team it doesn't end when I play. Like, yeah. I will always be involved. Yeah. I'll always help when, whenever and wherever I can. And for me, that the fact that they didn't have to say there felt like a win. It yeah. still felt like a win for me to see that they're that they're taken care of. For me, that's a win. Hello everyone, it's another Football Friday here on Across the Line with Chris Greatrich and Sidov Tupas. And for the show today, we have former women's national team player, Natasha Alquiros. Yeah, Natasha's come on the show. She's given us a really unique perspective on the, on the women's game. She talks about her experience growing up with a footballing brother and a, and a footballing uh, father. Um, she talks about the various um, careers that she's had within the footballing landscape. So. Um, that includes being a manager, as a player, um, working within the media. So I think there's lots of uh, interesting stuff that the, the listeners and the viewers will enjoy there. Uh, and then she talks about her experience with the national team and uh, she comes up with some very unique descriptions of the uh, living environments that she had to inhabit. So um, yeah, really insightful, um, really great interview. I hope everyone enjoys it. Well, definitely uh, something to look out for. Uh, this uh, Natasha Alkiros interview here on Across the Line, and if you wanna, if you want us to continue doing this, please support us via downloading the episode on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and also watch the episodes on YouTube and uh, subscribe as well. Do drop a comment on uh, our our, uh, our platforms here on Across the Line. Welcome to Across the Line with uh, Chris Greatrich and Sidov Tupas. It's another. Hashtag Football Friday for the rest of us here. And I have the honor of uh, being with two of my uh, partners here for this episode because I am, of course, with uh, my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Chris Greatrich. Hi, Chris. What's up? I'm, I'm good. How are you? I'm great. And, uh, of course, another partner of mine. I've worked with her for quite some time now and uh, actually uh, saw her blossom into this uh wonderful TV personality that she is right now. But of course, we all know she has a, a, a great footballing background and that's why she's here. Miss Natasha Alquiros, the former Maldita, is right here with us. Welcome, Natasha. Thank you. Great to be here. I, I, I Rarely do we have someone who has such a broad and diverse background as, as Natasha. Obviously, um, player um, with the national team, uh, you've been a general manager. Um, you've worked in the media. Um, a wag, dare I say it? Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, great to have you on the show. Uh, I know you just come back from Thailand visiting yeah. um, our boy, Mr. Dato. How, how's he doing? He's doing really great. You know, it's so great that he was able to get that opportunity to play in Thailand. And even from my point of view, being able to go there and observe like the Thai league in itself, like just how organized mm. and great it is, having that many teams, that competitive level, you know, it's really such an eye opener. How has he found the transition? Obviously, coming from being in the Philippines for so long to moving to, uh, you know, a prestigious Southeast Asian league. How has he found it? Well, at the start, of course, it was nerve wracking for him because it's something that this is what you're used to. Yeah. You know, this is. This is everything that you're used to. Your home is here. Mm -hmm. Your family's here. But then the moment that he got there, he knew there was like, there's no turning back. Like once you get there, yeah. like all you need is actually that one foot in that door and you realize that the football world is so much bigger. The <laughs> opportunities are so much, I'd say better. Yeah. Once you get to play on that bigger stage, because again, like 16 clubs in the first div, you know, bottom three get relegated. Yeah. So there's something to play for in every game. And of course, a lot to learn from. Yeah, we're, we're referring to uh, Mr. Patrick Dato, yeah. of course, <laughs> of uh, the national team who plays for uh, Supan Supanburi Football Club in the Thai Premier League. He's with uh, Alvaro Silva, also uh, an Askel. And uh, how has he helped him settle in, Alvaro? Yes, actually, Alvaro's been really. He, he's played such a great role for like Patrick during the transition. Mm. Like he's like an older brother. Like literally, the moment that Patrick moved there. Like Alvaro would always be like, hey, do you need help? You need to know how to get from here to there, how to open like the bank accounts, everything. Like he's been really 
helpful like you know not just like you know as an Ascal teammate like he's really more of like a brother to Patrick when it comes to like all of that helping him transition he's never played outside the Philippines yeah. so to be able to move to Thailand and have someone look out for you you know that's such a big and an important thing I think that's something that's really overlooked I think we were talking about it a little bit in some of the previous episodes when when people the effect it has on players um, kind of moving countries or the effect that it has on loved ones, family members, kids, etc. Um, so to have someone like Alvaro there to help him out as, as must have been a real relief for him. Um, one of the things that I think potentially would have helped him out was going straight in and playing. Because sometimes when you move clubs, you go you go in in a pre-season, then you have to wait yeah. a little while. But he went straight in and played. So how many games has he played thus far? I think so far he's played around five five six games yeah and how's he found the games well so far it's been really like high intensity yeah. like when it comes to the games as you, um usually it's like okay so during the first half and the second half you know everything's high paced but really the game like breaks out in that last 15 minutes mm. you know it's really anyone's ball game and for him it's just really a different experience you know to go against that many different opponents to study different opponents different tactics and how to handle going against other teams because again they have that home and away format something that we tried to have once upon a time so like to really be doing that home and away format in Thailand and to see it work you know it's such a Mm. I I I think I think to to me it's a a, you know it's a great eye opener as Natasha mentioned that someone like Patrick Dayton who grew up here um, played developed as a player here and uh, you know went through the ups and downs of his career getting injured um, uh, playing a lot with the national team and all of a sudden getting his chance in Thailand and actually proving himself that he's worthy yeah. to be playing for a uh, top flight club in Thailand which was some sort of a pipe dream like a few years yeah. ago and uh, you know we were like we were saying like Singaporeans were proud of Hassan Sunny playing well in, in the Thai Premier League and then all of a sudden you have uh, someone like Patrick Dato, born and bred here, studied here, played in the uni- in, in De La Salle, and then, you know, making his dream come true in uh, probably one of the strongest leagues I- in Asia. So, just 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 remarkable that uh, someone like Patrick has, has really established himself as one of the better players there. Yeah, absolutely. How did you find the games? Were you nervous watching him? Yeah, I was really nervous watching. I've only watched one game, <laughs> yeah. and I, I don't want to say it, but... I felt like a jinx because before I went there, they didn't lose a single game. Oh, wow. Like, it was just draws and a win. Yep. And he was like, a man of the match, like two matches before <laughs> that. And when I watched that one game, yeah. it was against Port um, Stoible. Yeah. So it was um, yeah. They lost. They, it was their first loss. Wow. Since he was so you're there. not going back ever again. So I was like, I think I should just go during yeah. training. No, no, she goes back <laughs> there, but she stays away from Maybe. the stadium. I know. Uh, she stays away from the yeah, stadium. That's so what happens to me. Uh, I think they uh, they played over the you know. Yeah. Then yeah. they played against Sato's team. Yes, Mong Tong. Sato scored also. <laughs> <laughs> Usually I'd be happy for him, but not <laughs> in this case. Like not at all. Yeah, absolutely not. Uh, that's uh you know what 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 are the things have you observed in the Thai league that is really you know I know you've uh, experienced uh, working here in the you know UFL and later in the PFL and you know talk about the you know the the, the huge difference uh, with regards to how things are being run over there it's just from a fan experience yeah. well from a fan experience like first of all like going to Sufan Buri and when how their field setup is i think it's just it's really just unique in a sense well not unique but it's it's supposed to be standard elsewhere but it's something i think that we should be able to do as well that they have a training ground Mm -hmm. so their training ground is different from their stadium and their training ground has like one of the best pitches you should actually check it out on youtube like the sufan buri fc like their training ground so it's really high quality grass you know it's soft it's beautiful and by it there's a facility so it's not the biggest facility but it's just enough where when you enter on the left side you have the locker rooms and then beside in the locker rooms you also have your hot and cold baths and right beside that there's a small area to store the things on the right side you have 
you know, the, the PT area for, you know, for all the players, you have like six, seven beds. The second floor of that on the right side, there's a small gym, but it's more of just for recovery. For th- so just for the injured players to be able to use that gym while, you know, the others are training. And on that left side, there's this class um, table, office setup where the coaches all meet up. So they all meet up and they all go down right for training. And right beside, on this right side, is this small, um, I guess, room, you could say it as well, where there's a projector and there's seats as well to be able to view the games and all that. Mm. So you don't need that big space really to be able to set it up. You just have to have, you know, enough space to have a field and a small setup where everything works well. And so just being able to have all that in one place and different from your stadium. So, of course, you know, your stadium Mm -hmm. stays beautiful during the games and all that. You only use it for games and maybe like, you know, uh, D1 days before the the Mm -hmm. game and, you know, your training pitches, that's where you train every day. Like, just having a facility like that and the fact that they get meals after games, after training, they actually have packed meals that are there for them as well. You know, it's just these small things that make such a big difference in how players play. Um, okay, T- talk about the atmosphere as well during the games and the support of the Supanburi fans. And well, again, another big difference is just that being able to be in a stadium that has a lot of people, to have so many fans there, home and away fans. Like I was able to observe hmm. like a big number of um, Port fans who were there watching in the stadium and just the number of people who would watch the games. And I guess you could also say that how much respect they have for the league, for their players. The fact that they know that they have two Filipino players there during the game that I watched, they had a Philippine flag as well. Like, so on the on their fan side, like they're the major Sufan Budi fans, so they had the drums and the setup, the Sufan Budi flag, a Thailand flag, but they also had a Philippine flag there as well. So it's for me, it shows just a lot of respect and mu- how much knowledge they also have yeah. on the background of who the players they are supporting. It's it's so Im- amazing to to hear someone speak in those terms about a country that, on the surface, we're probably at that level. You know, when you think about you know we we compete with Thailand in, yeah. in regional competitions, and there really isn't much between the two of us when you, when we go head to head in Suzuki Cups or, or or regional competitions. But the way in which you describe the setup, the training facilities. I mean, we have teams that are still getting changed on the side of the street yeah. at, at BGC <laughs> before they go training. Yeah. Do, you, do you know what yeah. I'm yeah. saying? It's only so, open yeah. for those exactly because on the parking lot. <laughs> right. You know, I, I remember training at, at McKinley Hill Stadium, you know, and then afterwards there'll be a Frisbee team, you know, coming, c- coming on. We'll be kicked off for Frisbee. You know, it, it's, 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 I, I think f- from a positive perspective, it's great that we are now allowing our homegrown players like Patrick, the opportunity to see um, what it's like, you know, a level or two or three or four up from what they're used to. And it's great to see them thrive because I, I'm getting various res- reports from other people, not just necessarily people within the Philippine football community that have said that the players have, have adapted really well and, and are playing at a really high level. So again, I think you were sort of intimating earlier. I hope it, it does show that there's a pathway out there for domestic-based players to potentially go and aspire to, to be you know, the next Patrick Dato or, you know, um, uh, Dosuke Sato or, you know, Kevin Ingresso, Martin Storblame. The list is endless now, yeah. isn't it? There's so yeah, many players playing there now. It's like 16 now. They're like 16 mm-hmm. now yeah. over there. And, uh, you know, in the Thai League, it's really, uh, you know, there was, a, there, were, there was a time when really when, there, when we, the, you know, we held the, we, we hold the Thai League in high mm. regard, especially yeah. com- coming from here and especially with the experience we have with the UFL and the PFL now. And then all of a sudden, oh, yeah. Our players can compete there, yeah. and uh, you know th- this is a uh, just really you know as you mentioned eye opening for for the rest of us that you know especially for the fans here in the Philippines that you know they they're they're actually ha- they actually have a lot of you know uh, of a, a say on the title race even uh, in the in the Thai league with uh, a lot of our players are contributing for their clubs. Yeah, but yeah, in addition to that, also just the fact that they have so many channels of where you can watch the game. So they have it on TV, they have it online. And the thing is that you have four channels. So through sport, two, mm-hmm. three, 
4, 2 HD. Yeah. So there's just so many venues. Like even though there are games happening on the same day, you can still watch all the games in good quality. Oh, so <laughs> it's amazing. It's an yeah. eye opener. It's, 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 it's just um, it's good for us to experience that for me because it's a it sees like you know you get to see all the possibilities where we can be as well. Yeah, but y you know that's what makes it remarkable as well uh, for for the rest of us here in 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 in, in the Philippine in, uh, Philippine football really in general because even with you know the huge gap on uh, in the the level of organization and the manpower of that league and the popularity it, when it comes to the national team games we're not even we're not far off no not at all actually so that speaks a lot of the of the character of the national team that we have as well that, and the level yeah i think for me obviously it's something to aspire to not only on from terms of the, of the players yeah but something from the administration standpoint yeah. you know hopefully that clubs soon will be at a stage where they can afford their own training facilities you know i, I know that at the moment that's not feasible but you know we have clubs that are sharing with municipalities or that you know they're, they're renting their slots at good facilities but it will be nice to garner more of that community spirit which you talked about earlier with um, you know, communities, towns, cities, provinces, whatever, having their own teams moving forward to potentially make that sort of scalable on, on a larger, um, you know, larger platform for Philippine football on, on a domestic level. Because I think that's the only way really we're going to progress. I know we sort of tried to do that a little bit with the PFL. Yeah. Um, I think we've had to take a step backwards, but I think moving forward in order to progress and in order for us on a domestic level to aspire to be like the, 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 the Thai League, um, you know, that needs to come um, sooner rather than later, I feel. Yeah, um, we're staying in Thailand. Stay the, in Thailand. Yeah, we're staying in Thailand. Yeah. And uh, uh, just recently, we had this. Um, we had our women's national team where Natasha was a part of it a f few years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, they they did actually very well in the AFF uh, championship and uh, first ever semifinal appearance. Although they lost to Myanmar in the third place battle, I I think the game just opened up in the last. Uh, 20 minutes for them they were yeah. it was nil nil for 70 minutes mm. and then all of a sudden the floodgates opened uh, the players were you know, a bit tired with uh, the hard game against vietnam really so um you know, talk about your observations of this current team that we have that is also seeing action in the southeast asian games later this year well i think that this tournament and being able to make it all the way to the semifinals it really just boosts up their confidence for the Southeast Asian Games. And that game against Thailand, really to to be leading 1-0, to score before them, one all at halftime, leading again 2-1, mm -hmm. that says that it gives a lot for their confidence. Though towards, as you said, like the first 60, 70 minutes, they were able to hold the game somewhat, but it was towards the end of the game that you know they weren't able to hold the lead anymore. But it gave a lot for the confidence in the sense that it's never happened. Well, not even through my lifetime of playing for the national team, you know, we never beat Thailand. And during the, I guess like the best run was just a 1-0 against them in 2013. But this one is different because the Philippines was leading 1-0 against them. So it gives a lot for their confidence moving forward to the SEA Games. Um, they have an exceptional striker, Quinn Lee, who played up on top. She scored those two goals against Thailand. So... Even to be able to lead, and yeah, maybe that was just 60, 70 minutes, but that's something to progress from for when it comes to SEA Games. And I think the reason why they didn't do so well against, or the, the outcome against Vietnam and Myanmar was that Quinley played really well, so they were playing direct. So a lot of the time, they were trying to give direct to her, but of course, by the time they went against Vietnam and Myanmar, they've also watched their games mm -hmm. against Thailand. They saw... Um, the speedy player that they had on top. So they always made sure that there were like two men on her. So they weren't able to... Two really, players on her. Yeah. Two players on wow. her. <laughs> just, football, just to cover him that's football. <laughs> when you said two players on her. <laughs> so, you know, they, they have to, I think, work around different attacking dynamics rather than just playing direct balls. But aside to that, you know, there's a lot of positive moving forward and the margins of their losses weren't big at all 
So it says a lot that in the next two, three months, they can prepare really well for the SEA Games to go against these players again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a to good put, gauge. Yeah, to put that into perspective, Thailand just came off a stint in the Women's World Cup yeah. in France. And we were, last year, I think we were so close to making the World mm-hmm. Cup uh, in uh, af- in the after the Asian AFC uh, Women's Asian Cup yeah. in uh, in Jordan, I believe. So, um, you know, the team is progressing very well under uh, Coach Lett. And uh, they might, I think I heard they might come, come up with a few reinforcements for the SEA Games, right? Um, but the thing is that also, the, I think the key, the key factor here as well is having Coach Lett. In the span of like my 10 years of playing football for the national team, we went through seven different coaches. Mm-hmm. And each coach, again, different preference of players, different playing style. You always have to adjust, adjust, adjust. But this time, you could see from last year or until this year, and I hope that they still continue to keep her as their head coach, you could see it's still the same players throughout the last three, four years. These are still the same players consistently getting called up to the national team. So you have your same core group of players playing every time. And for them to be able to progress, it's important to have team chemistry, to be able to play together, to still call up the same girls. So that's something, I guess, that's very different throughout um, the last, let's say, 10 years before that and the last four or five years was that you have the same girls. So the progression of the girls individually and collectively as a team gets better because you're playing with the same girls. I, I think the general consensus speaking to people about Coach Letts, she's very, very good. Um, I think also with, with Coach Let, it gives hope to a lot of aspiring young coaches in the Philippines because I think there are a lot of really good coaches here. Yes. And like you said, we, we were talking off mic and we were saying you had seven coaches, some, some from abroad. Um, you know, why wouldn't you give her a chance to continue the good work? She sort of has always been in, in and around the camp, hasn't she? Uh, yeah. co- coach She's Lett, part, for, part for, of the national team. Yeah, well. always on the Lett was, I think also for me, like one of my favorite national team players. She was still there when I first played for the national mm. team. And this was like 2007 Southeast Asian Games. She just gave birth. She just gave right. birth, and she still made it in time to be fit for SEA Games, and she played yeah. all the games. You know, it says a lot, you know, the respect that you can give to her as a player, knowing that she has a really good football background, but then even more so now as a coach. She's tested and proven, not just as a player, mm. but as a coach as well with, F- with the FEU team. How many championships she has? I think three or four already mm. with the club. So it says a lot that this is a player, a coach, who has the background. She has the licenses, if you know. Th- yeah. Th- there's, the yeah. Big, there's this whole big debate thing now of like, you know, coaches who don't have license to, to having the license. But this is a player who knows what she's talking about and has the credibility, mm-hmm. the A license and all that, and is able to apply it. I think she's the best female coach in the Philippines and I'd say even in Southeast Asia. Mm. All right. What, how do you think that, because the preparation for the AFF is almost a precursor for the SEA Games, which is going to garner a lot of attention, you know, with it being here. Um, how, how do you think the team is going to fare um, going into the SEA Games? I think they're actually going to do well. Um, I think that they'll make it to the semis as well. Yeah. They have a good chance of placing a medal of first, second or third in the upcoming SEA Games. With this group of players especially keeping them intact and with that with the same coach i think that there's still so much more potential for these girls and if you just give them the proper preparation Mm. that they need and this is on the hands already on the federation just give them that proper facility give them that proper attention that they need which i feel that they've been getting in the recent years okay maybe like this year and a bit of last year but and making sure that they prepare ahead of time, not last minute, put up a team, get the players to call up just one month, <laughs> two weeks before they... I mean, come on, what do you expect from these people? You know, everyone needs to prepare. Thailand, Vietnam, Myanmar, these girls have been playing together since they were children. Yeah. They live together. You know, they go train every single day. So we need to give that much love and care to our women's national team. You know, they're up. 67th spot now in the rankings Mm -hmm. that's a big jump they're 
they've made headlines everywhere. So you know that women's football is hot at the moment. So you have to take advantage of that momentum. Take care of your players. Very important to take care of your players and they'll give you back with results. Mm-hmm. I think it's interesting to note that, uh, uh, you know, to be fair to the federation, I think yeah. it's interesting to note that they come up with the women's league. Yes. Mm-hmm. I think that's big. I think that's big. I think you're part of that women's mm-hmm. league. You're playing there and scoring, but uh, not uh, with the national team. Doesn't want to be in the national team anymore. She's, she's quit already. She's retired. <laughs> but you know, I think I think uh, over the past few years, there's a lot of attention yes. uh, being put on the women's national team because I think the federation realizes this yes. is probably the closest um, to be. You know, with all due respect to the men's team, probably the closest thing that we'll get to. Uh, to play at the you know highest level in world football, yeah, especially when when the next World Cup expands, the women's World Cup expands to thirty two teams. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So from twenty four, it's it's going to be thirty two, right? So you know, it's a big chance there. Yes, and as you're talking about the women's league again, like that's for me, that's one of the steps that they've really taken forward, which is very important, is to increase the number of games that these girls are getting. Mm-hmm. Because you could say that the collegiate girls are getting a lot of number of games, they're getting UAP, uni games, and they're training every day. But how about their players who aren't in college anymore? So these girls have to find a way to stay fit on their own, but where can they get those games? So it's important to have that league to increase the number of games played for these girls so it's easier for them when they transition in the national team. But not 11 a.m. or 12 <laughs> noon games, all right? Yeah, <laughs> all right. absolutely. So. But where, where are most of the players coming from now? Like for the SEA Games, are a lot of them going to be guys from coming from abroad or is it a mix of um, those based outside and players that are playing currently in UAP or in the Women's League? Well, I, for this setup, actually, I think it's the best so far in a sense that it's a mix of everything. Okay. I'd say 60% is local base mm-hmm. and you have like 40% coming from abroad. But yeah. even the local base, you have a couple of girls still in college. But I think the majority of the girls are fresh graduates of college. Right. So now they're, they're also playing in the league for different clubs. And so it's nice to see their players who are playing clubs and you have collegiate girls. You have the girls coming in from um, most of them are from the U.S. Haley, Quinley, a lot. Um, these few players are from the states. So, and what sort of level are these girls playing at? Um, they played at collegiate level. Yeah. They played at collegiate, but Haley actually moved here. So okay. that's, that's a good thing. And she's following the footsteps of like Patrice and Pelido, who was also a, a U.S. based mm-hmm. player, yeah. but eventually moved here as well to be able to continuously play and train here with the national team instead of coming. You know, two yeah. weeks before yeah. the game. Yeah, just like you, Chris, moving from. Uh, yeah, and now I have to share a studio with you. <laughs> have the mighty fall. Yeah, yeah. What a what a downgrade for you, though. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, what I, we we've covered a lot there. You know, the Patrick thing we went on a bit too long. We're yeah. not interested in Patrick. Are we? But I, I, I want to focus on you a little bit now, because um, I think you've got a really interesting story. Like I said at the top of the show, very diverse. Um, background uh, experiences within the football world so I'm, I'm kind of keen to to delve into that really but um you're from a football family yeah right um how were you introduced to the game as a young child well i guess it started with my younger brother mm-hmm. playing football and seeing my sister play like intramurals football and I was doing ballet. I don't know why they signed me up for ballet. (laughs) And then I just saw them playing. I watched one of their games and I just said, I want to do that. And it just started there. Like the moment I started training, I just never stopped. So how old were you at this point? I was grade four, so maybe like 10 years old. So Nathan is how old? uh, younger? Uh, Just one year younger than me. Just one year apart. So Nathan Alcuras is uh, is, uh, Natasha's younger brother and he plays for Stanley FC and former under 23 player of uh, the Philippines as well. Yeah. So how was it? Um, first time you do, you know, doing the drills and then, wh- where was this when you when you um, first? Uh, I played for Woodrow's. We used to have a club team back then, but it was under Paref Woodrow's school. So I studied in all girls school mm. and we would train in Cuenca usually twice a week. Yeah. And I would play there but then I would also go home and Nathan and I would always play 1v1. Yeah. 
um, we'd play in our in the garden, like just one v one. Put you know slippers there, and whoever scores as many times as you can. And at that time, we weren't you know he was just the same height as me. I was I was even taller, so <laughs> it, it gave a lot for my confidence <laughs> going against him. And even moving forward, ever since I was young, I would always join like boys trainings. So there'd be like summer leagues and summer games. Um, there were teams called Yuha. That was under Ed Formoso. And then I also joined Sphere FC and Real Kids. Again, these were under uh, Tita Kathy. And mm. also Coach Ernie at that time, they partnered up and made like a club team of like all girls teams. So I would just play every day during mm. weekdays, weekends, summers. I just really fell in love with the game and I just wanted to get better. Now to our uh, listeners, it's uh, Miss uh, Kathy uh, Naza, um, mm. Revilla Nazareno is a- uh, God bless her. Yeah, God bless yeah. her. She's uh, passed on early this year. Very uh, you know, iconic figure really in uh, the, the, the game here in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you know, you know Nathan, you you were playing with the, a lot with Nathan, and uh, you know you, you might have uh, affected his confidence as well, huh? <laughs> yeah, because even growing up, um, he would he was also like naturally just really good, and so if he wants something, we were I was I was I'm a very competitive person, so if he won like a game or a tournament, I wanted to win too. If he won like MVP, I wanted to win MVP too. So we would like just rack up like competing side by side like him and the men's like in the kids for like the men's teams and me and like the women's teams so it was nice to have that healthy competition like growing up someone to play with and you know someone to stack yourself against to help you become better i, I know what it's like to have a sibling uh <laughs> rivalry yeah right, right. right. Yeah. but i i i think you're probably doing your dad a disservice here because he's, he's probably quite calculated in that fact that <laughs> look the most competitive games I had growing up it wasn't with my school team it wasn't with my club team it yeah. was with my brothers and my dad in the garden yeah simply put you know they were the most competitive games they're the ones that were the most fiery and, I, and if I'm being honest they're the ones that you probably learned the most yeah there was a time that of course Nathan got better he got faster you know how old was he at this point? 20, around 23, maybe 24? Like, no, tw- no, 13, 12, 13. Like, <laughs> yeah. He was also getting like taller than yeah. me and all that and more skillful. But then I learned how to defend and I learned how to slide tackle and all that stuff. I learned that from going on one-on-one yeah. against him. Maybe sometimes it was a foul, maybe it wasn't, but we'll never know. It's a garden play. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. And then, so from there, um, well, you and your brother progressed and then yeah. you ended up under Coach Hans. Um, I was first under Coach Maro okay. in the national team. So I got picked up by the national team. And how old are you at this point? I was. Um, I first started training with them when I was second year high school. So what's that? That's 15. 14, 15, 14, 15, 16? Yeah, around 15. Yeah. And, and which age category is this? For the women's open, like national full, team. Full, yeah. full national team. But I was she just was in a, their training pool. She was, was a still prodigy. 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 Yeah, she was I was prodigy. still in the training pool. Yeah. And then same during the like my third year high school, I only first was first able to play during my senior year in high school. So I was around 16 years old at that time. And yeah, it was all under Coach Maro and it said a lot about how much I love the game because even during the training camps and all throughout, I've missed so much school. Like mm. I'm surprised that I even graduated high school actually. <laughs> the, Cause the trainings would be 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning and then 6 p.m. to ni- uh, to 8 p.m. at mm-hmm. night. So and in any high school, your school is from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. So actually, I miss class every day from the all my morning classes. I only go to school after recess at 10 a.m. until 4 o'clock. Then I go back to training. And then again the next day and again the next day. So I'm always intrigued to find this out. I, I had this argument with my wife last night because I know there's yeah. a thing at the moment that government are talking about potentially um, withdrawing homework taking away taking yeah. Yeah. for kids so that, that came to light and I was talking to my wife about this because I've got two young sons and they're very active and I said to my wife you know what I used to get home from school at like four o'clock wolf down some food go training We I drive an hour away to train train for an hour and a half come back I get home sort of nine nine thirty yeah. by the time I eat bath then I'm supposed to do my homework you know, I, I struggle with that. I really, mm-hmm. really struggle with that. I, I was an okay student, but I really struggled just to find the time to, to do it. 
by the sounds of things, it was also difficult for you. How did how did you find the balance to get your schoolwork done, or did you find the balance? Um, I found the balance. You know, it's just really about the hustle. Really, at the end of the day, if you want something, you'll be able to do it. Right. If you don't really want something, you'll find an excuse. So, during lunch, during recess, during those car rides, mm. like that's when I'd be studying. That's when I'd be doing my homeworks, um, or when I'd get back from from training. And I lived really far, like one hour away. Yeah. And like, you know, that's when you type stuff up or that's when you do your work. And every lunch, I would take exams. So the good thing was that my school is very understanding. But it's just that every time I came back from a tournament, because you have camps before the tournament. So you missed school already. Yeah. And then you miss whole, like, you know, like 10 days, 12 days of school because you have an AFF tournament or you have the Southeast Asian game. So you miss a lot of days of school. But... When I'd get back, you know, I would never have lunch. I would just take an exam every lunch. And during recess, I'd be studying or I'd have like a bit of a delayed um, submission yeah. for certain things. And they allowed me to catch up. But eventually, you know, it all worked out. Right. Um, I actually did. I didn't graduate the same time as my batchmates in the sense that I walked. You know, they gave me a fake yeah. diploma, yeah. but really, I still had to take a few yeah. tests, so I wasn't done yet. But you know, for me, if you really want something, you'll find a way to make yeah. it work. And fake diploma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they I had they had to wait until I was completely done with everything. That's a, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. That's a very considerate of the of your school. Yeah, it was really nice that you know they were able to you know back me up in a sense that they knew what I was doing was impo was important. And so yeah. they allowed me a different schedule, but you know, still make sure I got the work done. Yeah, this was around the time when I first saw her play, mm. actually. Um, she was around 16. And uh, I remember covering, um, I was still back in Bacolod working, and there was a tournament, an under 17 tournament um, in San Carlos City. And uh, you, you, Played Muntin Lupa, right? That, yes. That Muntin Lupa we were NCR. Team. Yeah, they were they were playing in that mm -hmm. tournament, and and she was the MVP mm. of that tournament. So that was the first time, like, oh, this girl is good, and she was you know, pulling the strings. She, she was all over, man. Yeah. She was playing midfield, just playing on attack, just just defending as well. <laughs> so it's all around player, um, but eventually you settled into. A, a role in, as a defender or in with the national team, right? Like yep. right with the back? national team, I play wing. Usually, yeah. I play winger or wing back. That's mm. usually the position that I've played for the national team throughout my duration there. Yeah, couple of stints playing a center mid, just an additional player in the middle, but mostly at the wing. Yeah, and when how old were you when you made your debut? I was seventeen. Seventeen, oh. fresh. <laughs> That's yeah. <laughs> And then how many caps? Uh, I have 34 caps with the national team. And yeah, it's been a good run, actually. It's yeah. been a good run. Like, I've learned so much from all the different coaches. Like, there's, a, you know, there's always a positive to everything. There's a downside to everything. And there's a positive. And like, going through those many coaches with Coach Maro, Coach Joel, Coach Hans, Ernie, um, Dr. P, all these coaches is that you get to learn more about the game and so you see different coaches different coaching style different preferences so it's actually more of the players adjusting to the coach yeah. than the coach adjusting to the players so you're 17 when you made your debut who's the coach who handed you uh, the debut? coach Maro. coach Maro. and it was against the first one was a friendly against singapore okay in, the, in ultra in Ultra. I think that was wow. the last game in Ultra. It must have been. That makes it a dust ball now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you didn't, Nowadays, you didn't, there's, you know, there's yeah. coals you, you, everywhere. Yeah. You didn't floor. fall over a stone or anything. No, no, no. Okay. At that time, that was That's, still, you know, the field was still good okay. and all that. <laughs> all right. Describe to me that moment. I, I, I can remember my debut. I can remember it like it's yesterday. I can relive it. So what, what was it like for you the first time that you, you pulled on that national team jersey? Well, the thing is that um, because it was here in... In, in the Philippines, it didn't feel so like right. so yeah. real, and it was like a friendly. Yeah. So, and there weren't people. It wasn't <laughs> hyped up. It's not like how games are nowadays. Yeah. But like so back then, it just felt like another important game. Right. But really, I think the more important game for me, my first debut, I'd say, was when we played in Myanmar. 
Uh, my first tournament there was in Myanmar at that time. The country was still in like, you know, it was still on high alert yep. and everything. Literally, actually, the week after we were there, that's when the bombing happened and all that okay. back then. But um, so what my year is first this? game was um, 2007. Right. Yeah, 2007 yep. in Myanmar. It was against Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I remember like just walking onto the field and it was the first. You know, you, I've never felt so much pressure. Yeah, I'd say that I actually didn't do so well in my very first game right. because, like, everything just like came flowing in. Like, yeah. you know, um, just you know, for me, that feeling of having your country on your back yeah. and having to deliver and perform. But I'd say that mentally, I wasn't so I wasn't calm or composed yet, but <laughs> it was a good experience. You need to get through those yeah. hurdles. Like yeah. nothing's ever easy the first time around anyways. But yeah, I remember that first game against Indonesia. We didn't get the win, but everything that I learned about football, like of how much I loved the country, how much I loved football in general came from getting that chance to step on that pitch and play in front of people, in front of a lot of people actually in Myanmar. So. That was like the first chance that I felt of really, ah, oh, like this yeah, is it. Like, yeah. you know, this is a different feeling. And once you get an experience of that high, you just want more and yeah. more of it. Like football's a drug. Yeah. And it's really my favorite drug. It really is. Wow. You, you, you sort of uh, you got uh, that your eyes lit up while she was uh, Telling her story. Yeah, I, I, I think you see uh, people have described, we, we get people to describe their moments when they put on that jersey with a national team and, and everyone looks the same when they, <laughs> when they describe it, you know, that little twinkle in their yeah. eyes. And, and, and it's just, it's a really proud moment, isn't it? Yeah. I think when you get to represent your country in that way. And this is 2007, so this is sort of pre ASCAL, this is yeah. sort of before football was f football now, which is, you know, on, certainly on, on a. Um, an elevated level of kind yeah. of popularity. Um, how, how was it in those days? Like, what was your preparation like for those tournaments? Well, actually, the good thing about back then was that we had an allowance from PSC. They, we would get an allowance monthly. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, the, and we would have consistent training. Like, we usually train twice a week right. in ultra, like even like prior to tournaments. And then when it was almost time for tournaments, then we'd have closed camps of staying in ultra right. train in the morning yeah. play and then you know train again at night so there was it was very consistent for a while and then there was just a big jump because there was a sea games there that 2007 or 2008 sea games mm -hmm. that we did poorly we had like a big loss against thailand and then all of a sudden that was the same time that they decided that to cut the allowance for the okay. players so at this, you know and then they changed they transitioned coaches as well there's a time that it was just blank they didn't know what they were what the next jump was because we kept doing the same thing same preparation expecting the same results right but the other clubs i mean the other countries were you know doing more by the next tournament what can we do now better what can we do now better so they were continuously improving and we were still on the same flat page so in terms of and in I guess like PSC and all that it was like very results oriented. Right. So if yeah. you don't get the results, you don't get the allowance. Yeah, that, that I think that was the policy before. Um even until now. I think if you medal on the SEA Games yeah. or just showed that you are a, a potential medal for the SEA Games, I think that was the policy. You get a it, it it's it's um they're graded differently. Yeah. Like if you're a potential gold medalist, you have a different allowance. Potential silver, different allowance. Bronze, different allowance. And I don't think they, they've, uh, with team sports uh, right now, I don't think they're, they're doing it anymore. Either. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're doing it anymore. But, um, you know, you talk about that, your experience with your national team. Um, I remember getting a call from you um, a few years ago. I, I, I really want to ask her this question. <sighs> Go on then. Because she, she, was, she, she called me yeah. out of the blue. Right, like, I I said that for well, this is Tasha. Yeah, yeah. What's up? How 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 how, how can I help you? It's like, ah, oh, we're having problems here. We're having problems with the national team. Yeah, <laughs> having this in the camp. Uh, we're seeing a lot of, 
in, in the dorm. There's not there's uh, unwanted visitors, animals in the yep. dorm, and then, and then, and then I I talked her over, and then okay, and then I, I gave her advice actually. So, um, talk about that experience right there here. Okay, so. <laughs> You know, when you start with the national team, there's stars in your eyes mm -hmm. and all that. And the moment you play, while I was in college and even all through like high school and college playing for the national team, again, always stars in your eyes. But then towards 2016, I think it was 20, yeah, 2016, this was my last tournament with the national team. And are you allowed to curse here? No, I'm guessing not, <laughs> right? I don't know the right terms for it. Go on, you do what you but want. But then... um. It was really just shit preparations. Like yeah. there's really no other word for it except for it was shit preparations. Um, they put us in ultra. Mm -hmm. So imagine ultra hasn't been used for no. years and years and years. And t for this tournament, we were they put us in ultra, but we were training in Rizal. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine even just the drives for from ultra to Rizal? And in ultra. There were mushrooms growing inside the cabinets of the rooms. Mm -hmm. There were, there's like moss underneath like the tiles and you could hear like, you can hear it when you step, like you can hear it. So it's not like, you know, stable floors outside of the dorm room. And that's dorm rooms of like, you know, 10 girls per room, 10 girls in another mm -hmm. room. Some girls got like uh, bed bugs, bed, yeah. uh, bed bugs. And then outside would be like, it's not really like, Cat shit, mm. like right, right outside, and then there's also cats there, and I think there was one time that there was a rat even like just outside, <laughs> and we were staying there, and we were training in Rizal. It would take us two hours to get back, you know, at night, and then in the morning again you're training in Rizal, and then another one hour and a half to get back, and then you're staying in Ultra, because it's free, and I don't know like but. It was just really bad. Like even also like at that time it was under um, Coach Buddha. She wasn't very um, effective as a coach at that moment, and maybe because of the conditions yeah, you're, conditions you're, you're also, facing. Also like same as a coach. Like it's also frustrating that mm. this is what the PFF gives you. This is their budget for you. But then for me like there's it's not being maarte, but there's hazardous. It's you know like sanitary like sanitary issues and concerns so i guess all of that and a lot of other outside concerns making us train in san beda where it's like the pitch was you know mm. non-existent and you know even like right before we would leave so it's just that being in the national team for such a long time you know you know at least what you deserve and so when they give you something that's really just you know here like, you know, just like find that, like, you know, they, don't, they didn't even like put enough care for their players to even just give them proper living, a yeah. proper living area for mm. their preparations. And, you know, not, there's no money there. I mean, not like money's important, but like not even a per dime. Like girls were hungry in the airport. Like, you know, we had $10 each. You had to budget your money of like, okay, what, you know, you have to even search around the airport and look like, what can my money afford me to buy? Because you're hungry. But, you know, other girls also didn't have other, like, you know, they didn't bring pocket money. Not everyone has even extra money, but, you know, we were paying ourselves to be able to play. We were paying to play. Yeah. And so it was just really like, really bad preparations and, and what everything. was the preparation for for which competition um, was this AFF, AFF same in, tournament same yeah now. just in Myanmar back in 2016 yeah and so it just came to a point that it was just really bad and I l cried almost like every week I would cry and I would even talk to the coach I said hey coach I can get you this like um I can try to get you BGC let me know I'll get you BGC I said coach we need this in the the rooms and so I bought like tiles I bought like you know like I would buy mm -hmm. things and like these aren't that's not my job like I'm just supposed to play like as much as possible the job of a player is just to play you shouldn't give them any other obstacles or struggles they should just be focusing on the game I think that that's what you could only require from your players mm. is to just focus on the game but to have your players you know cleaning every day cleaning literally we're always cleaning 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 because and it's not even enough to clean it because it's really just just you know really really bad like yeah. it's it's 
Um, I'm sure there are other parts of Ultra that are nicer that were renovated, but the ones that we were given was just really bad. And so this was after the tournament. Of course, the results were weren't good as well. As expected. As expected. And I think that it, it comes with the preparation. What were the results? Um, we lost to Thailand. Yeah. We lost to Myanmar. We lost, we lost. We only won against like Singapore. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the typical. Typical, like, we were again in the same position where back in 2013, I'd say it was the closest. We were 1-0 against mm. Thailand. And then to fall back behind again to go, like, 4-0 against them. You know, just results that you, were, you already saw yourself so close. And then now, instead of keeping moving forward, we're taking three steps back. Mm. And again, a lot of that has to do with the preparations. Right. But so there, that came to the point that I called Sedelf and I was like, this is too much and I didn't know what to do. So I was like, I'm gonna expose PFF. I was like, I'm gonna expose everyone. You know, I was like, yeah, right? <laughs> I was just angry and frustrated mm -hmm. and just fed up because it was just too much. And so there I called him, I was thinking, you know, what, like, you know, I'm going to, I, I had took photos of everything. I literally took photos of everything. Um, I was gonna write, like, you know, I didn't know. I was like, where should I expose them? Where should I expose them and all that? But then he gave me actually really good advice, you know, to like calm down. Yeah. <laughs> Number one is to calm down and really just, I guess, send it to where it just needs to be sent. Yeah. And I think that was the best advice that I took because. So Delph gave good advice. Yeah, he actually really? gave good really? advice. Really? <sighs> because. I don't believe it. At that time, I didn't know any better. I was, just, you know, only seeing things from a player's point of view. But when you see the whole picture, who does that help? And yeah. you, you realize it's true. And I had to make these mistakes. I had to, you know, go through all of that, I guess, to realize that as well. That, you know, if I expose the PFF or if I expose everything of like what the the preparations they gave us what will we get just more negativity from everyone yeah like that's just gonna add on more hate and it's not like at that time the women's national team were in a good position to be able to make demands right. you know we weren't getting results so how yeah. can you make demands yeah, you're yeah, not yeah. even make getting the results and so i decided to just send a six-page letter yeah six-page letter complete with um photos. documented photos mm -hmm. and all that but it was really i'd say well I wrote that really well with the other players as well. I right. gave everyone a chance to be able to write how they felt, gave it back to me, and I summarized it up, just making sure that we stuck to the football of it and yep. the preparations and leave all the personal things out. Because, yeah. you know, in every game, there's always a bit of personal, but yeah. we decided to focus on the game. And yeah, so I wrote that and uh, we gave it, we sent it to three important people, I'd say, which was to. Nonong Araneta, the PFF mm -hmm. president. Um, we sent it to Miss Lelaine, the women's head, and we sent it to Ed Castanas. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, part of the reason why, you know, the team's so yeah. much better now was probably what yeah. the, was that letter. And I yeah. think that, yeah, like it was a, an important step. And I think that, again, it was really good advice from Sadelf that. It really was. I told you, I, I, I don't even know why I'm saying this. Oh I can't gosh. believe that I'm actually complimenting him Please, also. Don't. I also cannot don't believe finish it. Don't finish this sentence. <laughs> but yeah, it was, you know, to take a step back and see it from a different way and maybe mm. just send it to the people who need to know, who can be able to make sure that the same thing doesn't happen again. And I'd like to say, even though that I'm not in the national team anymore um, and I chose to stop, that it's nice because I always... I always talk to the players. Yeah. I always talk to them. And I ask them about how are your preparations? Where are you staying? And all that. And I, it's nice to know that they never they never had to go through that again. Yeah. And so I guess it helped them, you know, in a different way. And that's- In a positive also, way. In a positive yeah. way, I'd say. I think it's really, it, it's such a, such a difficult scenario to be in. I actually remember that time. I think, um, I was at Kaya, we were coaching, uh, I had a coaching session down in Rizal. I think the girls were on after us. Yeah. And I think Aris asked me to speak to the girls. Um, just an impromptu chat really, and it ended up being a speech. But it was it was kind of all around that, that issue of like, I, I know it's hard. I know it's not nice when you're in, in, a, in a situation whereby you put in a facility that's substandard 
I then had to give my account of when I first came, which was pretty similar. Yeah. I was I was staying in Ultra. Aris was the head coach. But and, you were uh, staying in Ultra at what year? Uh, so it'd be 2004, still cat poop. 2016. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So still cat poop lying about <laughs> yeah. and still, you know, guys um, drying their dirty undies, you know, on a fan next to my bed, <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. But the, the overriding thing with, a, when I think the overarching theme with this whole, um, this whole particular theme is that you just want to play. Yeah. You just want to play really ultimately. It. And it's, you know, I remember having conversations with Aris like, God, this is so hard. I'm not sure I can do it. And he'd be like, you know, we need you. So, you know, just try to put it to one side, put, put you know, put those feelings to bed and just focus on playing. Yeah. You know, and, and obviously, like you said, with, with, with the letter, hopefully that was the catalyst to potentially, yeah. it didn't help you out per se as a, as a player moving forward, but for other players in the national team, potentially that was, that was something that helped them. So yeah, yeah more for you and potentially, um, you know, helped your peers further on down the road. Yeah, because at the end of the day, um, I think that, well, for me, and my involvement with football and the women's national team, it doesn't end when I play. Like, yeah. I will always be involved. Yeah. I'll always help when, whenever and wherever I can. And for me, that the fact that they didn't have to say there felt like a win. It yeah. still felt like a win for me to see that they're, that they're taken care of. For me, that's a win. Like, w- people have to go through things so that the future generation won't have to go through that, you know, yeah. Someone has to go through it so that other people will make sure that they don't go through that. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was still a win like yeah. for women's football. I think the preparation wise and more people who came in also into football after that. And again, with the rise of the men's national team, the women's team is also like getting effects as well. And yeah. now the women's team are also making names for themselves. And yeah, it's nice to see the positive like you know again i put that to bed already I, I, you know it came to a point there you know i was i was depressed like yeah. um you know it, pu- it pushed me to the point that i quit football yeah. because i knew what we deserved i knew what women's football deserved like i knew that we could do so much more you could see the potential of the players if you just took care of them mm. you know they could do so much they're not even asking for much there's no monetary gain literally <laughs> no monetary gain for women's football you know we don't get anything out of this but it doesn't matter we'll play anyways and yeah. we'll play our hearts out every game just because we love the game and just because we love the country yeah so i think the least they can do is take care of the of the team and i think that towards the past two three years since that time actually it's all been positive since that time moving forward it's been positive from having the women's league to having more people support women's football and having those camps Mm. having um the, the the camp in japan you know having all these things being put into place moving forward you could see that we're at least headed in the right, right direction. direction. I think that, I Close think the, the results gap. show that. Yeah. yeah, I think the results show that that after that uh, mishap, then every, everything's gone up really. And uh, you know, would like I, I'll transition to uh, you know, of course, you wrote the letter, and then eventually, I think that was a good springboard for your media work. Yeah, <laughs> that helped you <laughs> because, because even while I was there, and I was. The thing is that because I'm older and I know better and I have connections, I know people. And I was like, you know, imagine I'm the one talking to the coach. Hey, coach, you know, I think I can get you this field. Let me know. I, I think we can just train here instead of training in San Beda. I'll try to get you BGC. Just let me know. And like, you know, oh, we need this for the for the dorm to make it at least livable. Like, oh, we need this. Or like handling a bit of like the taxis. And like after doing all of that and writing that letter, I was like, I don't know. I guess it also transitioned for me that there are so much more things mm. that I can do that maybe as a player, you can like, you know, you play for the team, but then there's more to football than just playing. Mm-hmm. There really is so much more. And that you know, in, in terms of managing, in terms of writing about football, I guess it's somewhat also opened up that avenue for me that I can do more for football. So, so yeah. So, I mean, for people who don't know, you, you're on the TV5 network um, doing, doing hosting work. You do other stuff within the football yeah. f- um, space p- pertaining to uh, media-related stuff. And and also recently, you've been the um, manager at, at Stallions yeah. uh, of, of the men's team. So 
you know, how have you found sort of working in those different spaces? Which ones have you have you enjoyed or, or not enjoyed so much? Um, I think what I enjoyed the most was until now actually it's really commentating and covering oh, really, football yeah? games. Like, I love it. Yeah, it's, yeah, she loves it. I she loves you know, it to get to do <laughs> what I him. love to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I cover for UAP. Yeah, so I cover with ABS UAP football. So to be able to cover the men's football games and the women's finals every year for the past three years. Mm-hmm. And then t- now to transition to be able to cover the Ascals yeah. games, the AFC, um, the AFC games, and all that. So I think that you know, as a person growing in football, like that's my favorite space to be in to continuously talk about football because I love what I do, and I think that it, there's not a lot of women who do this. There's not a lot no. of not a lot of women no. who do this, and it's saying that. You know, you don't have to stick to the norm always that you can break barriers. You can try to do things that have never been done before and open open new boxes for other people to try to be able to achieve. And commentating and covering football games for me, it's because the game is always changing. You're mm-hmm. always learning. And to be able to, again, cover games, to be able to be sent to Vietnam, to be able to be sent to Bacolod every game, you know, gives me like for me like for someone who's very passionate about football it makes me feel good also yeah. personally that to be able to achieve such things actually a lot of a um, lot of her a lot of people do not know that Tasha actually took a coaching course yeah so I think that helps you right yeah. with your work as well in the on on, uh, on TV yep so um, back then I took a FIFA course I took my C license Mm -hmm. and then um, last year I was that last year yeah that was last year I took my B license as well Mm -hmm. I lived in Panaad Stadium Mm. for 20 days how was that? (laughs) It was good. I was already used to it. Yeah. <laughs> I already have background. She trained well. <laughs> yeah. She trained well. Five star hotel. I trained my mind oh, very yeah. well. So it was actually a really good experience to be able to to take my coaching course there and not do it in Manila. Yeah. Because when you do it in Manila, well, for me, like doing it in Manila would mean that uh, I do this, but then I also have my other job. Yeah. But when I'm there, I could really just focus yeah. on the football and to learn so much, to learn even more. And every time I take a course, I feel that I learn more about the game and there's still so much more that I want to learn and having coaching courses and hopefully even other other football courses could help me to, you know, just learn even more about the game, be able to apply it, help people understand football better. Like this is not a football country. So everyone's still learning as well. So trying to close that gap of more people being more knowledgeable in football, it's very important. Yeah for the growth of football here in the Philippines. Is that something you'd like to do? Would you like to go into coaching? Um, I think that for now, no. No. Because I don't have that full commitment yeah. to be able to do that because I enjoy covering the games. Um, I like covering the games and I like doing the media work. Okay. At, at mm-hmm. the moment, I think that I should follow the momentum of the media. <laughs> <laughs> like critiquing all the the players not playing well. Yeah. yeah. It's so much better, man. Yeah. You should try it. No. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> Just try it. You're like, I like coaching. I'm like, he's not playing well. What, what's going on with him? Yeah. Because <laughs> so. well, one of the reasons why I, I had this conversation um, with Simone Rotter when he came on the show. Yeah. And um, he has so much to give. You know, he has so much experience, good and bad. You know, bad experiences that he can share with kids, some positive ones on the field. Um, you know, I, I, I feel that with, with you also. I think you have a lot to give. You've, you've worked in so many different spaces. Um, you've worn so many different hats already. Um, you know, I think it would be a shame for you not to. So if it's not now, I'd, yeah. you know, I, would like, I would like for you to join. Join the, uh, the good fight that I'm fighting, yeah. not you. You're, you're just been nuisance. But um, yeah, I would love to see you on the, on the she's sidelines. Good, she should be first. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. at the side. moment, I'm still playing, technically. Yeah. So um, though I'm not playing with a national team, I'm still playing club football yeah. for Stallion Haraya. So I guess I want to be able to coach once I've put the playing to bed. Yeah. In a sense that I still want to get all those pl- the playing out of me so that when I coach, I can really give just a hundred percent to it i don't want to yeah. coach and give like 20 yeah. percent of me like 30 percent oh maybe just on saturdays but of course it's something that i i could see myself doing too like i feel that um, all the training all the learning all the heartbreak 
that I've had in football and to still love it so much. You know, um, football put me through hell and I called that love. You yeah. know that saying? Yeah. And that's really what I can say about football in general is just that, you know, I really love it and I think that there's a lot of people who can learn from it. Yeah. Boys, girls, whatever, it doesn't matter, but like... Are there a lot of girls coming through? Yeah. Because uh, I, I, I'm obviously on the youth football scene. Have you seen a lot of young, talented footballers coming through the system? Um, yeah, there's a lot. Um, I think one of the, for me, like the brightest stars now is Sarah Castaneda. Mm, very good. So, yeah, like she's, I think. She's part of the team. She's part of the team, yeah. consistently starting since she started back in 2015. So her first, her first outing was around 2015. Mm. And, you know, I think that she's a good like catalyst, like a star for like yeah. you know an example of homegrown young talent who who has done well for herself in Zabel, in Taft, yeah. you know back to back championships, and then also in the national team. So to see young talent like that develop into the player that they are now, to, to be in the player that they are now, like you have the likes of Sarah Castaneda, say Ina Palacios, mm-hmm. you know Camille Rodriguez. These are players. Who have consistently been with the national team since they're young, since they were young. Yeah. Camila and Ina have been playing since they were around same age as me, yeah. 16, 17, when they were that age. And there's a young girl as well, Shai Del Campos. Yes. Scored a hat trick against yeah. Singapore. Yeah. It's just uh, coming off her rookie season in La Salle. Scored in the final, right? Mm-hmm. In the UAAP final. So. I think uh, I think the future is in good hands. I think yeah. women's foot. The future of women's football is is in good hands, in terms of having again also the fact that there's so much more club teams nowadays mm. the fact that there's so many venues for girls to play in and the fact that there's so many open play football as well and it's mostly guys so when you're the only girl there usually yeah. that helps you play better because you're like you want to compete against um, players who are, I guess faster than you Yeah. and so you know it pushes you a bit harder every time so I, a lot of these young girls now have so much venues to play and I think one one really good area as well is Toloisa Don Bosco not sure if you're familiar yeah, yeah, if very, you're familiar with them so, right? yeah, so they have their teams yeah. when they join those, um, those tournaments but they also have a women's team as yeah. well and they're really kicking ass really they're good. kicking yeah. ass like they play 11 aside for the for the women's league yeah. our team just lost to them yeah. 6-4 high yeah. scoring game and they've got their own facility, haven't they? And they yeah, yeah, they have a they, nice the, training. All the students around. come out and they watch. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a really nice so, uh, nice area. Um, and to have these young players learn the game, have such high football IQ at such a young yeah. age, you know, that's something to really grow from. And to see that, especially in the women's league, when I see that with teams like Nomads, you know, you, yeah, before you just look out for the for the UAP players you're like okay if they're, you're playing in La Salle FEU USD you're most probably going to make it to the national team like that's it but now you see that there are more areas where you can get more players you know you have the Nomads team you have Toloisa Don Bosco you have a bit of the older girls in like Stallion Hiraya mm-hmm. and in Outcast yep. and such like that so to have all these venues and have more teams playing more girls to scout it says a lot about the growth of women's football something that wasn't there yeah you know, let's say five years ago even four years ago that was something that wasn't there but to see us grow into this space where women's football is in the right path it's nice to see it in this whole like positive angle that they're trying to grow it into something more into again hopefully and as we've seen it's been translating the results with the women's the national, national team. team. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, I, I'm not sure if this is a stigma that's attached um, to um, younger uh, Filipino girls, but I had a conversation with a parent the other day. I hope she doesn't mind me sharing this story, but we have um, at my academy a handful of super talented girls, just as good as the boys, um, mm-hmm. if not better. Yeah. Uh, really talented. And um, I was talking to the mum, and uh, the girl's six turning seven. The grandparents came to, to the session, first time they ever seen her play. And she's easily in the top probably three or four guys in a very talented U17 that we've yeah. got. The um, mother turned to me and said, oh, this is, this is the first time that they're coming to watch um, the girl play. Um, but the mother wants her to be a model. <laughs> and then she overheard the conversation. Yeah. She shouts out, yeah, look how dark she is already. 
because she'd obviously been outside playing football so much yeah. that, that her, her skin had, had gone dark. Is, is that something that, um, is that just a generational thing or is that something that a lot of girls actually encounter, that sort of having to navigate between, you know, what society deems the norm versus yeah. actually, you know, I want to play football because I really love the game. Yeah, actually, because usually when you're a girl, they'll be like, or you go to train, they'd be like, shouldn't you be playing volleyball? Yeah. Because in a sense that they, th they associate sports that football is masculine mm -hmm. and volleyball is feminine. So you should be playing sports that are feminine. But then you realize... It's indoors. Yeah, it's most, indoors, most stuff like yeah. that. But um, you realize that a lot of football players turn out to be really tough cookies. Like everyone, every female football player is a tough person yeah. because they just made up their mind and th they decided though it's not the norm to play football yeah. because again as you're saying like in your academy like also at young age young age groups there's usually only one yeah. girl yeah. one to two girls and then it's all guys yeah good for the girls they get better training yeah. you know like at a young age they're like you know so much more motivated to compete but then um there is that that generalization yeah. that you know that girls what are girls doing in football but i think that in philippine football it's not so much it's not a it's not a big of a difference okay. on, like compared to like i guess other countries more conservative yeah. countries right. but here you could see that it's not there yet so people would prefer yet yeah, like um their kids play certain yeah. other certain sports but but when you, as you said, like when, but when you ask a kid and she's like, "I want to play football," like, that's it. Once they've decided that football is it, like they're just in it. Yeah. And if you talk to female football players, a lot of them are just really mentally tough people. Yeah. Because they've decided they want to play football, regardless of what. That's not what society is, expects from yeah. them. Yeah. I think that's great, and uh, for me. There is no better time to try and push this. I mean, we've all just had a really, really good Women's World Cup. Yeah. You know, I think the, the American um, women's team has opened up all kinds of doors, you know, related to uh, gender equality, equal pay, you know, equal rights, all that, all that kind of stuff, which I think is great um, for society as a whole. Yeah. I think what the women's national team has done in the AFF championships, I think is great for the domestic game. The fact that the, the women's league is ongoing. You know, I'm involved with the YFL. We've got people like Candice and um, yeah. but Bella and Fernando, obviously um, involved with, with those projects. You know, really, um, like you said, strong, passionate um, females in the game. I, I'm hoping that, that that then creates this sort of funnel towards, um, you know, more homegrown, high quality young um, ladies coming through the system because I think that tempered with you know getting you guys from from the US or the or yeah. you know guys from abroad um, you know there's no reason why you can't get to a World Cup there really is no yeah, yeah. as long as the preparation's right and, and you continue to go in that in that vein if we can marry all of those things together you know the sky's the limit I think for, yeah. the, for the women's yeah, game that's true. exactly like there's a lot of homegrown local talent that you know that are just you know if you just continue to give them that opportunities to continue to play they'll continue to play yeah and um because even um at that time that i was still playing um i was around like 25 26 and i would train on my own i would join open plays all these things you, you know you'd have to find a way how do i stay in shape yeah and you know sometimes i would join even like the stallion training at that time like back then like i would just be on the side and join their agility drills like just you know yeah. like anything that i could even just for like those 30 minutes 40 minutes where i could just do it like you know you find different ways to try to stay in shape but it would be nice if there were again which which is what they have nowadays they have proper they have the women's league they have a, now we have like the sevens football yeah. league you know you have all these venues to be able to play and I, we should just keep with the momentum. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a lot of negative in football, but you should focus on the positive. <sighs> See? I, I'm a changed woman. <laughs> what have you done to her? <laughs> oh, no, there's a lot no, of negative I, football, but what does it do? Complaining won't do anything. Complaining won't help us get to where we should be anyways. Like we need to be proactive yeah. and be able to do things. and. Um, help in any way that we can because if you believe in something and if like, you know you believe in football you believe in football I believe in football and we do it through our own ways you guys have this podcast and you wouldn't do it if you didn't love football 
That's true. I, I think that, you know... He, he just is, loves working with me. <laughs> he just loves working with me. That's that's the reason why he did this. And so, you know, just yeah. find your <laughs> space. So. Find certain spaces where you, where you can help. You don't have to be that all-star person that changed the world yeah. or that changed the whole game. But in your small spaces, in any way that you can help and give hope, why not? Because that's really what we need more than anything. You don't have the best of facilities and all that, but... I think when it comes to the fighting spirit, yeah. it's something that re- that's really... It's that's, innate, that's isn't it, to the difference. Filipinos? Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's so true. That's why we can compete with all the other countries who are getting like better um, preparation and all that. But it's a fighting spirit, that's something that is born you, in you. Can only, you can't buy that. But it can only get <laughs> you, you so far as well. <laughs> yeah. So you have to... Yeah, yeah you need that, uh, all the ingredients, the preparation, getting it right. So that's pretty much covered a lot there yeah we want to be mindful of your time uh, you know we know you have uh, other dad's going to get upset yeah, with us I, if we keep you too long <laughs> but we, we normally i like to sort of find out what sort of on a final note what does the future hold for you like what do you what are your what are the plans for natasha well i'd like to think that um at the moment I, i'd like to i like staying in the present so what opportunities that have come to uh, to me as well are the opportunities that I'm exploring. And at the moment, it's a lot of commentating and covering games. Mm. So for me, it's, that's where I want to be at the moment in terms of media, being able to talk about the games, cover as much games as possible, give more light to football, try to sell it as much as mm-hmm. we can to everyone out there. And But for me, the future is an empty, it's an empty open blank. Like, it's there's so many doors possible yeah. and i know that there's so much that i can give in football maybe you can get there her. really is maybe you could get her to co-host <laughs> you want to replace Wait, me you're, no are you, you're trying to replace me <laughs> no 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 of course not but no. yeah like i think that there's a lot of space i can do when it comes to coaching when it comes to managing when it comes to even just having that full-on support but for me now what i'm trying to do is to learn as much as possible mm. So that's why like, from, I've, I've already done it from a player's point of view. Being able to manage Stallion for those two years, mm-hmm. I learned a lot about um, people management, yeah. handling, um, dealing with different scenarios, with team, with flights, with all that stuff. And now being able to cover media, I think it's more of just like, I'm trying to gain as much knowledge yeah. as I can to be able to help and to give back better. Yeah. yeah. Because... You know, you can't really pre- prepare for the future. Like, look, all of a sudden, it can take you to Thailand. You know, yeah. you'll never know. You yeah. don't know where it's going to yeah. take you. So you just, I just focus on the present and the, just give my 100% in whatever that I'm in right now. And if I do well, as long as I continue to do what I love to do, doors will just open. Yeah. Yeah. What a perfect way to finish. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, we'd like to thank uh, Miss Natasha Alquiros for uh, spending time with us on Across the Line. Hashtag Football Friday. Um, you can subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and uh, Spotify. Don't forget to review the podcast because uh, it means a lot to us. And uh, hopefully we can still continue this week in, week out. Right, Chris? Absolutely. But no, thank you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and um, you know, enlightening us with some, some really great stories. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. And of course, it's great, time, great to be here. You know, thanks for the opportunity as well to you know, just talk about more about football. That's it for us. Uh, uh, stick, uh, no, continue listening to Across the Line. Uh, next week, we'll have another episode for another Hashtag uh, Football Friday. This is Across the Line with Sadaf Tupas and Chris Greatrich. Thanks for catching Across the Line. If you want us to continue doing more episodes, subscribe to us on YouTube, download our episodes on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and on Spotify. Also, drop a comment para tuloy-tuloy itong Across the Line.